Happy New Year, right? Oh, I, I saw the thing counting down and it just seemed like, no. Oh, well. Uh, yesterday, you might have tuned in and seen Mrs. Walker talking to you about her new reading class. And I'm here to tell you about pre-algebra. And I'm going to go through, just so you know what's happening, and explain to you uh, what are the kind of changes that we made from the last time that lessons were recorded for pre-algebra about six years ago or so. And so what are the changes and then what is going to be the same? So that's really the format. And then at the end, we'll have some time for you to ask questions and answers. So if you're thinking of something that I don't go over, then write it down and send it in and we'll get it answered to the best we can. Let's get started. First of all, and our next slide says, what is new? And so the first thing is, if you see there, it says only the A and the B homework. Now, if you're new to BJU Press, you might be wondering, what is he talking about? Well, if you look at our secondary math textbooks, after each section with the teaching material, then there's exercises. And there's an A and B and C, and then cumulative review. The A is your basic problem for that section. The B, uh, maybe it puts two things that were separate in A together, something like that. The C are the challenging problems. They are sometimes beyond anything that was explained in that section. So here's how we do this, here's how we do that. That's the A and the B, the this and the that, and we'll put them together in B. And C is, well, what would happen if it was dark on Tuesday and it was raining and your cat ran out, you know, those kind of extra things to see if you really can go further. And the reason we did this is because we listen to you guys. We get reports back from DLO, Distance Learning Online, every year from your survey, uh, marketing, who's hosting all of this. Uh, they do surveys um, and focus groups, and we've heard back most of the time that the fundamentals and the pre-algebra, it's just hard. Now, there were some that said it was too easy. I felt like we should skip it, and I'll talk about that later. Um, so we listened, and the most people were saying it was hard, so we weren't dumbing it down, but we were focusing on the essentials on that A and B section. Now, if, by the way, if you uh, heard me talk last year and you remember everything about fundamentals, a lot of it's going to be about the same. So that's the first thing. The next says that there is no problem-solving sections. Now, what I mean by that is you're going through Chapter 1. There's 1 1.1, 1 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 1 1.4 sections. And then there's one that says problem-solving. And it, it, they give you hints and ways to attack problems. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But again, in the idea of let's focus on the basics. What do you need to know in math? We eliminated those, and that gave us about 14, 15 lessons. Okay, what do we do with this? I went on further. I think there's 48 sections in all the chapters that we split into two lessons. So something would be just, I'd be talking really fast and trying to get this all in and get it done. And we split it into two days, if you will, so that you're getting, again, the same material, but we go a little bit slower and cover a little bit deeper and wider, but not make it too challenging just the way it should be. So that's one of the things by getting rid of the no problem solving sections. Um, next, it says homework. Uh, the last time I recorded these lessons, what I basically did was go through the A and the B and select the odd homework. Now, that would be about roughly like 1 to 30, 1 to 35, so about 15, 18, maybe something like that problems, plus the 10 cumulative review at the bottom. So roughly there were about 30 problems that you had to do if you followed that plan. Now, <clears throat> by the way, moms and dads and facilitators and all those people, it's up to you. You know your child or the child that you're supervising. I give you, here's how many problems I think you should do. You feel free to adjust that. For example, my, 
my child is really, really bored. This is going so slow, it seems like, and he can do the A exercises before you explain anything. Okay, maybe just one of each type of A exercise, a couple of the Bs, and then have him do all those Cs that I'm not going to go over to challenge him. Or flip the coin around. <laughs> he can't get it. Okay, we're already forgetting about the C. Maybe only do a few of the Bs and focus on the As. And don't have them do 20 problems if each problem, t and legitimately, takes 15 minutes. I'm not talking about, okay, I'm getting everything set up. And 10 minutes later, I, I can't get this because they haven't even started. You, you know what I'm talking about. If they're really working on it and it takes them, ah, well, you need to try and figure out it may be some problems with some past courses we're building up a wall of math and there were holes in that wall and now it's getting a little unsteady. So adjust the homework. But I've cut the recommended homework problems down as you see. Um, the next thing it says the skill checks are explained on the videos. In our middle school, junior high, fundamental seventh grade, pre-algebra eighth grade we have skill checks. And what that is is here's an example or two of the first type of problem. Now, you go do it. So it's the immediate reinforcement. Can they do it and can they get it right? Now, the last time I went through and recorded these, the skill check answers were in the back. I didn't do anything with it. One of the comments that came, we want more examples worked out. So I thought, hey, that's perfect. I'll work out the skill check examples. Now, sometimes I'm just talking you through it. Because it's at the very beginning of the lesson, it's just a couple little things. and So I'll just say, here it is. Other times it's problems to work out, and I will work them out. So there's more feedback. Again, what they do is, uh, I got all five of those, three of those skill check problems. Okay, if you've got them and you know you have them, you know why you, and what you did, you don't have to watch me go over them, have them through that. There's, that's okay. Okay, they don't need to watch it if they've already got it, but those are explained. Now, on the next slide, it says less quizzes. Generally, there were four or five quizzes per chapter. Sometimes we, we cut that down to three or four. Depends on how the chapter worked. Some of the chapters stayed the same, some less quizzes, but there were much less questions on the quizzes. I looked at those quizzes and I didn't make them. They were made up for the course. And I looked at them and I thought, that's too much. Because there would be 14 questions on a quiz and six of those were workout problems that are going to take an eighth grader a minute or two. Okay, that's like a 20, 25 minute quiz. And do you really need four problems that are of this type? Okay, we're going to add. We don't need to do that four times. If you have one problem where you're adding, you show that you can add. Now we'll have one on subtracting, and I'm just you know, making it up. One on multiplication, one on division. Okay, there's those four problems, and one or two more aspects, and we're done. It's do you get that, usually it's about two sections. Do you get those two sections, can you do the problems? That way you know you'll be ready for the test. Also with the test. I forget the exact numbers. I think there were around 20, I'm sorry, around about 40 questions on each test. And now the test, I will explain. I believe it says less questions on quizzes and tests. And the next build is the quizzes and the tests are synced with the chapter review, specifically the test. Because I looked at those and said, we do this, we do that, we come to the test, and there are these problems that I haven't seen before. And I went through and looked at those tests. I did not make them, and I thought, you know, there's one or two problems that go beyond. They're like, okay, this is how far you went in the lesson. Let's see if you can get the next concept or idea or leap, however you want to say that. And... I don't pedagogically agree with that. If I haven't taught it, I shouldn't be testing it. So I got those. As a matter of fact, what I did, um, we have a chapter review. 
there's about 50 questions. I don't assign all of them. I will pick one or maybe two from each section. So there's 15 or 20 problems that they're assigned to do as a chapter review. And I will go over that, those problems, on the chapter review day. The next day is a test. And guess what that test is? If the first question said 2x equals 14, the first question on a test is going to be 3x equals 16. Exactly the same type of problem. So to use some computer terminology, wissy wig. What you see is what you get. So that the chapter review is essentially a practice test. And if you go through and get that material, then you don't have to have this anxiety. And maybe your child is one of those test takers with anxiety. Well, let's see if we can diffuse some of that by saying, hey, I got this right. I know it. Now, tomorrow, or if you take the test right after you watch the chapter view, however you do it, I'm going to go through and I'm going to solve these and I'm going to get it. And after all, isn't that what we're after them getting it and knowing that they've got it and understanding how they got it more than doing 40 questions on a test? So that's the way I believe. Uh, next, it says shorter lessons. The last time we recorded, we were under a 30-minute limit that we basically needed to fill just about all that time. It was 28 to 30, 30, something like that. Now it's, no, you don't, 30 is as much as you should go. But if you're done, you can stop. You don't have to do a little song and dance and stretch it out to 30. And that means that I can focus on what needs to be there. And I've totaled up the time so far, and it's averaging around 23, 24 minutes. So that's not like, OK, you're done in 10. But it's also, when we're finished, we're done. Um, then uh, we had a four different segment series in the old pre-algebra the last time it was recorded. We're only using two. And they're much different. They're more high techy. The um, framework, I think you really like that. It's a voiceover with a lot of pictures and motion. It's going to appeal to our phone savvy teenagers that want action and things like that to talk about what's going on in this chapter. That will be at the beginning of each chapter. And then I picked out, I think it's about 10 or 12 areas that can be confusing. And I try to explain it clearly. But sometimes the students listen to me, and it, those words just don't make sense. So the other one, math explaining, it's a fast draw art, if you know what that is, kind of thing, with animation of that art explaining with a voiceover something that I'm teaching. Uh, the one that I can think of, first of all, is uh, the greatest common factor and the least common multiple. And those get confused because the greatest common factor is the biggest that's smaller than the smallest number. The least common multiple is the smallest that's bigger than the biggest number. And <laughs> what did you mean? Well, they made characters with little, what was it? Um, Little Frank and some, I forget the names, and had them animated to help get into that concept and what they're doing physically. So just another way to present that might appeal where maybe my verbiage isn't catching the students. So that's really what is different. And again, we have listened and we hear. I, I go every year, I look at the DLO surveys and check that, well, not necessarily every year, but every time I'm coming up for a new course, look at all the year's surveys, look at anything that has come in. What can I do to better focus and hit what you need? Um, what is the same on the next slide? I believe that the job of a teacher is to make the incomprehensible comprehensible. I mean, if a student could just simply take the book and read the book, why do we need teachers? The idea is that I know how 
what this material is, how it fits into the previous, how it fits into what's coming later, when and where and how you're going to be using it so I can teach it that way so that you're ready for when it's used in the next chapter or two chapters or three chapters, which by the way, that brings me something I did not mention. I talked to you about those cumulative review problems at the end. You are free to adjust the homework between the A and the B and the C, but you will incur the wrath of Harmon if you mess with those cumulative review problems because um, one of our competitors, they review all the time, okay? I taught with that series when I was in Florida for a few years. And I told myself, if I'm ever teaching math at Bob Jones when I came up here and started teaching, I'm going to do it that way. I'm going to make my own review sheets and everything. And guess what? The press beat me to it because they realized that there is worth in reviewing because what happens you have this material in chapter two and you don't use it again to chapter six so what happens we get to chapter six okay guys how many of you remember chapter two? Oh, uh, nope because they haven't seen it for two months so in those cumulative reviews it goes back to that material not every day but every so often they'll see that and that way it's not, I haven't seen that for two or three months. I don't remember that. Now i got to go back and get that, and we're going to go further. So please do all, generally 10, cumulative review questions in every lesson. Pedagogically, it is a requirement. That's what I believe. Um, so I'm going to explain things as simply as I can, and I have there the next thing using real-life examples. Now, I mentioned this in the fundamentals, and we also do it in the pre-algebra. There is some confusion when you're going through, if you know the order of operations. At the end of the order of operations, it says that you do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. There's a certain order there. And it is the multiplication and division, and then the addition and subtraction. But then later on, we're doing these algebra problems like 2x plus 3 equals 12. And the first thing we do is get rid of the addition. And the students are going, <laughs> I mean, back in chapter 1, it was multiplication and division first, and then addition and subtraction. And now you're doing addition and subtraction. I don't understand this. It's just a bunch of, <laughs> okay. So I thought, how can I explain this? And I thought of something that I think I came up with. Or maybe I read it somewhere. I'm, I'm not above stealing other people's ideas, okay? And the idea was very simple. When you are working with a bunch of numbers, you are doing and going down that list, and you do the multiplication division, you do the addition subtraction last. When you are solving, you are undoing, you're going backwards to find out what x is equal to. And then when you go to check it, you put that number in and you do it. So the solving is going backwards, the checking is like the doing going forwards. You've got two opposite operations. Hmm, what can I explain that with? How about putting on your shoes and socks? What do you put on first? <laughs> it better be your socks, right? What do you take off first? It better be your shoes. So you're doing opposite operations, so you're going to do the steps in the opposite order. So solving an equation versus putting numbers in and simplifying, which are the two main things we do in math, solve and simplify, they are opposites of each other in that sense. So we use the opposite order. And I will, that's an example of a real life situation to explain something mathematical. You know, the proverbial, I want to hang my hat on that and make sense out of it. And the last thing it says, enjoyment. I enjoy teaching. I was just talking with some of the managers. They were talking about which courses and that, and I won't go into all the detail, but they were laying out which ones for the next few years. And can we, yeah, we can squeeze that one in there. I'll get that one done in time. I'll just need another person to help out with paperwork. Just let me go. I would rather be teaching seven classes 
than sitting at my desk. Ask anybody that comes around. Yep, there's Bill out walking around. He's Because I can't sit there for three hours doing paperwork. I want to be teaching because I want to explain something and help make it make sense to the students. That's what God gave me to do. So I love teaching. I want your child to love learning.